I'd much prefer a world where there is a, a level playing field and there's not between men and women negotiating. Society has very different expectations about behaviors of men versus women. And so as a result, women have to negotiate differently. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the Hard Truths Playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. In my previous episode, I spoke with Margaret Ann Neal, Distinguished Professor Emerita at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. We spoke about her must-have book, Getting More of What You Want. We looked and applied her core evidence-based principles from the book to a live negotiation example. And in our conversation, we covered techniques from framing your proposal through problem solving, finding a balance between value creation and value claiming, and how to ask for what you want. But we left off with a very important question. How does the negotiation process change for women or other underrepresented groups? And how can women negotiate more effectively? In this continuation episode, Maggie will answer those important questions based on her research and much more. We'll start by returning to the live example from that last episode in which I just revealed to Maggie that my client was a woman. Hope you enjoy it. A lot of your research has looked at how when women negotiate, there's a difference. And this very much came up in this case. They felt bad about asking. And your research shows that a lot of women or people in general also don't, which puts them at a disadvantage. But the research also shows, and I want you to help unpack this because I know you really much look at this area, is that when women do ask, they still don't do as well as a man who asks, or they get penalized or backlash. And this was very much in her consideration. Oh, if I ask for these things, also I'm you know, moving my family and my husband up there, I'm going to get penalized for this. So how, it's a complex subject, but you've looked at this a lot. How, how, does, how does the client manage that, those dilemmas? So there are a couple of ways you can mitigate them. So let me first say that I'd much prefer a world where there is a, a, a level playing field and there's not between men and women negotiating. So so, you know, all of my attempts to mitigate the challenge are because society has very different expectations about behaviors of men versus women. And so as a result, women have to negotiate differently. And so women are much more effective negotiating when they pair their ask with, and this is, this is I'm going to give you the quote from the research, a communal concern for the other. Let me give you my interpretation of that. Collaborative problem solving. So right. you see, it's really hard for you to think of me, and this is the challenge women face. If I just come in, we're going to have a negotiation around dollars, around my salary. It's really easy for you, whether you're a man or a woman, as my person with whom I'm negotiating, to, to really attribute greed, demanding, being not nice and unpleasant to me as a woman that you wouldn't attribute to a man doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same situation. Because society really demands that women make people feel better. That's one of the roles that we have in society. And it's not just Western society. It's basically human society. And so as a result, when I negotiate for more money, I don't make you feel good. And therefore, you're much more likely to resist, right? And to see me as, as bad in those ways. So the first thing is, don't negotiate. 
and I'm not saying, you know, don't negotiate it kind of a meta sense. I'm saying don't negotiate a single issue, and especially salary. You're going to get backlash. Number one. Number two, propose a package, multi-issues, and characterize that package as a solution to a problem your counterpart has. Because it's really hard for you, the person with whom I'm negotiating, to see me as greedy, demanding, and not nice if I'm helping you solve a problem of yours. Here are the resources I need in order to solve, help you solve this problem, right? This is very different than I want more money. And so that's the challenge that we face, um, is basically negotiating differently. You need to be have a communal orientation for the larger interest of the organization or the individual with whom you are negotiating. And in doing so, you can, in fact, uh, reduce this notion of, you know, I'm being greedy for myself. Uh, we know that, you know, it used to be, in, in fact, we spent a lot of time telling women that the challenge, that the reason there was a gender gap in, in salary was because women didn't negotiate, right? Women don't ask. You may have heard that statement. And, and it is true that women were more um, hesitant to negotiate, and, they, and for good reason. Number one, this backlash I've just talked about. But number two, it turns out that women systematically have lower expectations on average than do men. So think about facing an, uh, a situation where you don't think you're going to get very much and you're going to get a lot of pushback. Right. Why do it? Yeah. Right? And so first the question was, okay, we've got to get people to actually negotiate. Okay, fine. So now, you, you know, we move forward in time and... When we, we now have studies which show even when women do negotiate, <laughs> it's not the same, right? So they, they need to negotiate differently. And we did a study that was published back, uh, it's published back in 1920, no, 2021, not that long ago, uh, where we looked at two competing hypotheses because there are two ways women could come out with less. One is, is that they, they don't even ask because it's like, you know, it's too much trouble. It's too, I don't want the backlash I'm concerned about being perceived as all of this stuff. So I'm just going to be, we call it the tameness hypothesis. That is, I ask for less. Okay. And I could get, and if I ask for less, I'm likely going to get less, right? Or it could be that women act just like, you know, depending on what they're, how powerful they are, they act just like men might act with that power, but they get backlash. And so we said, okay, each of those could result in, a, in an outcome where we have a gender gap. And let's, let's pit these against each other. So we got 2,200 pairs, negotiating pairs, of which 40% were male-female, 40% were male-male, and 20% were female-female. And these were, these were executives, MBA students, undergraduates. Uh, these were folks from the U.S., from Brazil, from Europe. We basically got, you know, but they were all coming to, to learn about negotiation. So it was all folks who were in a course in negotiation somehow, whether it was a day-long course or a week-long course or a graded course. And what we found was interesting that there was no difference on average between men and women performance, okay? And the reason we think that was true was because folks were already in a course to, to learn how to negotiate. So oftentimes this disparity between men and women is a function of women choosing not to negotiate, right? But now everybody was negotiating. We saw no difference in average performance. But we also had another condition where we had folks who had really good alternatives and folks who had really relatively poor alternatives, and they were negotiating, and sometimes you negotiated with somebody. If you had a good alternative, you negotiated with somebody. Some, some dyads negotiated with people who had good alternatives and some with bad alternatives. So you had all possible conditions. What we found was that, remember I told you that when you have a good alternative, you do better? What we found was is that that is true for men, absolutely, period. No, no caveats, no qualifiers. For women, when they had good alternatives and they negotiated with someone, male or female, who had a poor alternative, they did fine. But when they had a good alternative and they negotiated with somebody who had a good alternative, they were six times more likely for that negotiation to end in impasse. That is no deal, which means that they didn't get the benefit in the negotiation of the, of the better alternative because they got the backlash because people said, I'd rather have an impasse 
the negotiate and give you, and by the way, we, we, we checked it out. Women don't act any differently than men with good alternatives. So their reservation price, their aspirations, their, their uh, alternatives were the same, but women ended up in impasse in these situations and men ended up in deals. So we got evidence that strongly suggests that it is the backlash. So the, the result of that is realize that if you are not strategic in how you ask, there will be backlash. That is what, we, that is what your, your exam, exemplar was expecting, right? It's harder for people to backlash if you're solving their problems. So it is really important. And in fact, the perspective that I take now, which is about this collaborative problem solving, was something that, that arose because of my interaction working with women and realizing that there just has to be a, a, a different way of negotiating, but then realizing that men need a better way to negotiate too. And so yeah. this, you know, there's not that you know, all guys are like, oh, we're, you know, negotiation superstars. They're not. And so they're, they're also having some of the same problems. And so let's just move all of the people that, whom I can influence to think about negotiation as collaborative problem solving and just simply stop using the term negotiation because whenever you people hear negotiation, they start armoring up and get ready for a yeah. fight. And it's like, I don't negotiate. Yeah. I, let's solve a problem that we both can find a solution to yeah. that works for both of us. Yeah. So the key there is to avoid that backlash is mm -hmm. to enter it as kind of joint problem solving and how you frame it and ask yeah. it, which very much benefited the client. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say to your point here, those principles have helped tons of my clients who are men. <laughs> it's made them much better negotiators when they approach it in that regard. And here is the other twist, which you already alluded to, but I want to bring was the client here was also in Asia. So whether we call that intersectionality of a woman and an Asian presenting, and there was some concern about Hmm, how is this going to play in the context of my culture? And what helped in this case was seeing them as principles. There was a level of, of hierarchy there and respect with how the ask was made and how yes. it was framed. It was slightly different than, say, an American context. But anything that you would add there, because you do work with global executives, differences when you overlay an international context on this or different cultures? Absolutely. I mean, part of the issue is, you know, when you are problem solving, you need to solve the problem in the context in which the problem is created, right? So, you know, I pay attention to the, the and, and, and truthfully, you know, we, we, you talk about, you characterize this as a problem that exists like cross, organ, cross national boundaries, but this also exists cross organizational boundaries, right? Different companies have different cultures. And so you could have a culture that is extremely uh, hierarchical and you need to accommodate that hierarchy. You could have a culture that is extremely egalitarian, right? All the dimensions on which cultures of origin differ, cultures of companies differ too, right? You know, so the, the issue here is one of being sensitive. And that's why it's so important to understand who your counterpart is. And, and, and the languages and the perspective that they take and how they interpret behavior, right? And, and that's why planning and preparation is so important. Because, you know, if I kind of walk in and I don't pay attention to, to the attributes of the situation in which I'm, I'm engaged with, I'm probably going to do something that's not going to be as effective had I not taken into consideration who my counterpart is, what's important to them, and what would they see as a, a solution to a problem that would work for them? Yeah. So once again, that importance of listening, paying attention mm -hmm. to uh, context. I, I also want to bring this up as we're talking about gender and, and differences here, is this topic that always gets plays around likability. And wanted you to speak to the competence versus likability paradox. I've heard you speak on that because it does feel like as you move up in organizations, the air is thinner, there's a lot of interdependence and competition, uh, that not everyone's going to like you. And I've heard likability is overrated. How should people, especially women, be thinking about this? And, and you know, you've looked at this over time. So I think one of the challenges that women face that men don't have, and that is that, that women are really faced 
with a choice. They can either be perceived as likable or as competent. Uh, likable women are not competent or not perceived as competent, and competent women are not perceived as likable. Men, on the other hand, can be both competent and likable, which is a great place to be because we, you know, male or female, we all want to be liked. We don't want to be that person in the organization that is the pariah, right? And so but part of the reality is, is as you move up in leadership positions in organizations, you need to move the organization in ways that may be in opposition to how other people, some people want, right? Maybe good for the organization, but there are going to be people who are going to have some, incur some cost with that change. And so one of the things that you need to come, um, come to an awareness of and peace with is that you will be less liked, typically, as you move up in the organization by some folks and more liked by other folks. Okay, fine. But we all want to be liked. And so the thing that, that, that I have that has worked for me, and this is what I tell every one of my audience members, uh, when I, especially when I speak to women, is, look, we all want to be liked. But it is simply not something that, that, that can't be the sole motivation. Because, you know, the, the, I've, I've had managers, I've had deans, for example, who people have characterized as everybody loved that dean. Yeah, and, and those people were also characterized by, and they didn't do anything. They didn't change the status quo. Everybody loved them because everybody got along, and the organization suffered because of that. So if you are a leader who has responsibility for the long-term health of your organization, there are going to have to be changes made because the environment will change, and you have to adapt to the environment, and therefore changes are made, and sometimes people are, are harmed by that change. So being liked is important. And I can tell you that, you know, right now I'm on the road. If I go home, I have three dogs. And when I come home, they are ecstatic. And their ecstasy is expressed in their jumping around and they're so happy to see me and they don't leave my side. And they're like, you can even interpret their behavior, even though they're mute, they're like, our lives were so dull without you and we thought we were all alone and now you're back and there's sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and everything we love. So my response is, if you need to be liked, get a dog. In <laughs> fact, get a rescue and save two lives, right? So, you know, we've got to find ways where we can, we can find the love that we need and it may not be at work. <laughs> Immensely practical, and yes, I have Manchas here, helps me inevitably. There's a theme here, Maggie, of as we've talked through all these pieces, what the research says, what some of the stereotypes, for better or worse, the field is not level, that we, we need to somehow come to peace or work with or become comfortable with being uncomfortable, some of these uncomfortable situations. And... If you're always kind of trying to manage that, it can be very cognitively taxing. Mm -hmm. How does one manage that? Are there some, you mentioned having outlets, right? Like mm -hmm. your dogs. But if we're constantly with this load of having to rethink everything we're doing, it's, it's pretty tough. And, and maybe that is leadership in a nutshell. But can you talk a little bit about, you've mentioned unlearning, reframing, but what are ways to get more comfortable with this? Well, I think, first, I think you don't have to do all of this work with everything that you do. You have to sort of prioritize. Yeah. Where am I going to spend the time and effort? You know, one of, the, one of the comments is, you know, I do a lot of work planning and preparing for important negotiations. But a lot of what I do in my sort of small negotiations, the small in negotiations, right, is it's almost second nature. I, yeah, okay, I walk, you know, as I'm going into a, a negotiation, I, if I know the, the per party across the table from me, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about what's of their interest, what's, you know, wh what, what, what's important to them. How am I going to be able to achieve an outcome where they're going to feel like they, were, they, that they, can, they can willingly say yes to me? How am I going to frame that ask? Uh, I also think about, well, you know, what's the po what, where's the point at which I say, you know, this is going to work and I'm going to simply go elsewhere? Uh, what do I hope to achieve? I can do that, you know, in these negotiations that are not that complex. And I, so I don't have a lot of cognitive load on that. But I also think that there are times when you need to embrace the discomfort. 
And I think of that in a variety of different ways. So yes, you need to embrace the discomfort sometimes. You set an aspiration. You're rarely going to achieve your aspiration. So setting that aspiration actually increases your discomfort with the outcome, right. even though you'll do better. Yeah. Right. So there's that knowledge that helps you out. Right. I may be feeling bad, but I think I did better than if I hadn't done that. And the second thing is, is that you need to be an adult and you need to say discomfort is important and discomfort is actually a nice cue. And this this relates whether you're negotiating or whether you're making a team decision, because you know, the, the better your team in making decisions, the more conflict there's going to be, the more discomfort there's going to be because people are pushing and shoving and trying to find a, the best solution. And that's an uncomfortable position to be in. And most of us actually try to suppress that conflict, suppress that uncomfortable feeling. And in doing so, we reduce the quality of potential outcomes. So that discomfort motivates so I'm one of those people who says, yeah, I know. I understand. I love it when I run a meeting and everybody agrees with me. You know, and that's what I want. I mean, you know, if I'm the running the meeting, I, you know, I have an idea where we should be going. But my outcomes are worse off if that were to happen. Think of this discomfort. Think of dissent as a gift. When people disagree with you, it forces you to think more expansively and creatively about potential solutions. Because the one you thought of to begin with without their involvement may not be focusing on the larger picture, understanding all the important components. And that's why teams are more wonderful when they, they're more effective. They're not more, they're not, they're not necessarily more quote fun. You know, we like teams where everybody kind of gets along and we're all moving in the same direction and it's efficient, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have a good outcome. And it's the same with negotiation. Quick solutions are oftentimes Splitting the, let's, let's split the difference. We do that all the time. It, 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 is, it is demonstrably we are worse off. So. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. Dissent is a gift and... You've touched on this, this, this last part that I want to ask because we have focused on negotiations, which you are very much known for, but you are equally as known for, and it would be a separate podcast, around managing groups and teams and getting optimal performance. But I do want you to just comment because this idea of joint problem solving, the pieces you just talked about, very much feels like the connection to your leading work around managing groups and teams. And, and this is very much then connected to a, the topic of the decades of around DEI. And so could you just here talk about some of the key pieces here that would be useful to people around optimal group and team performance? Well, I think that it, when you think about what makes for an optimal team, optimal team performance is a function of bringing together people with differing perspectives. And we oftentimes think about a diverse team as diversity of demographics, gender, race, age, ethnicity. But what all of those demographic characteristics are, are imperfect signals of differences in perspective. Because my experience as an academic has also been informed by my experience as a woman who is an academic, right? So it's different than your experience as a man who might be an academic, right? So it's an imperfect signal. And that imperfection, right, is, is sort of what makes it more difficult because, you know, you could imagine uh, if we had a group of very demographically diverse lawyers you might think, well, I've got, I've got diversity here, yet law education, legal education, is an incredibly homogenizing experience about how to think. And so actually what you've done is you've narrowed the perspective. So, you know, you really don't need a room full of lawyers. What you need is a room full of people who come with a different perspective on a common problem. So, so that's number one. Number two is what we also know is that when people are too much alike, the importance in the interaction becomes let's maintain good relationships. So they privilege no conflict over the quality of the outcome. 
when you have a diverse team, it's not that they don't want to have good relationships. It's just not the primary goal. So the quality of the decision becomes more important. And so they privilege that and you have a very different set of interactions. And so what, what I'm suggesting with my research that I've done on teams is in many respects very similar to the research that I've done in negotiation, which is how do we maximize value creation and the parties getting what more of what, what they want through the interaction. And that creation of synergy requires us to basically embrace discomfort. Agreement is wonderful, unless you're agreeing on the wrong thing. <laughs> unless you're making an easy decision. So let's put the difference, right? That doesn't understand the basic assumptions that we need to maximize for a solution that is long-term viable. And so part of it is, you know, you've really got to think as an adult, and this is one of my, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek kind of responses, my biggest suggestion to you is be an adult. Realize that you have to embrace psychologically uncomfortable situations for the greater good. And that's just what being an adult is about. That's it in a nutshell. And that's it's tremendous, uh, the parts that you have just highlighted there. I mean, breaking it down into a very, very, very kind of useful and easy way to kind of think about this, but em embracing the discomfort. Thank you. Maggie, as we come to the end here, when, whenever I have a very distinguished guest like yourself, I want to do a very quick lightning round. There'll be short answers. And so with your okay. permission here, I'm going to hit you with these. Is that all right? <laughs> all right. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> all right. So the first one is, is it your horse or your dog or dogs? Or Michael, it's not or, it's my horse and my dog and my husband. You mean ordering of what, importance? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, which one there? Oh, uh, this is going to be public, right? Okay, my husband. Uh, <laughs> and, and then my dogs. My horse, so it's really important to me. And and and, and I hear you're going to put my, my uh, TEDx talk up so people can see it. Sal is still around. We are in a great place. And she's, she's amazing. And I am so happy that we got through that bad part I talk about in the talk. Yeah. I will put that TED talk up there. She's 21 years old now, so she's getting old. You Which know. very so much illustrates the point of going in combative and then how Maggie shifted mm -hmm. and has now a wonderful relationship with Sal. Second question, as I said at the very beginning, many first, a, a groundbreaker, first as a woman in your field. Of all those firsts, which one are you most proud about and why? I'm most proud of the doctoral students that I have mentored and the junior faculty that I've mentored and the, and the part I've played in increasing access to folks who were not normally present in academia. And as you mentioned, I'm the first woman for a number of reasons. There weren't very many women. There are now more women. Um, there are more people of color. And that has been the joy of my life, has been being able to help facilitate those folks being successful uh, in their careers as academics and actually gone on to be successful in their careers. Some of them, not all of them went into academia. Some of them have gone into organizations and, uh, you know, non-academic organizations like real world stuff. And it, it's just, it, it makes me feel like I have actually had an impact. And that's the, that's the thing I'm most proud of. A huge impact. And on a previous episode, I had Peter Belmy, who was one of your students. One of students, my students. One of yes, your students who I, did. I and, and you've written multiple Peter. papers together, too. Third question here. Um, your book, Getting More of What You Want, was written with an economist. You alluded to that earlier. And, you know, collaborating kind of across with a different discipline, what, what was the biggest thing that brought to your, your thinking? What? What, what economics brings is a standard to help understand what could be in a negotiation. And recently, economics has come around to realize that, you know, we can't just assume perfect information. There are a lot of assumptions that economics made about people's behavior that they were, you know, fully rational. And, and so, you know, lately economics has begun to sort of realize that the world is a little more complex than that. People aren't fully rational, but they are systematically, there are systematicities that we can use that help us predict 
our own foibles as well as the foibles of folks across the table from us. And that systematicity is important because it allows us to be able to, ad to, ad to develop uh, strategies to respond to that, to that less than rational behavior. Hmm. And so what the economists, what my economist colleagues have done for me, and, and particularly my colleague Thomas Lease, who was my co-author in this book, is really help me understand what what economics can can do to help us frame how to be more effective negotiators. There's a lot of stuff in between. You know, it's, it's sort of like it's sort of like guardrails, right? There's stuff in between. You can behave a lot of ways in that in between those guardrails, but it gives you a nice standard of what what you're aspiring to in terms of outcomes. And the, the fourth question is, is, in your long and distinguished career, influence negotiations, decision-making, team performance, has there been any point where you've really shifted um, how you viewed things based on new evidence or some of your research? Um, would there be any kind of marker of how you've kind of seen something in a new way? I'm always curious of... So, yeah, I mean, so it's not like... <laughs> left turn, right? It's not like one of those things. Right. What it is, is there are curves, and there they've been a lot of curves in my life. One of the curves, and, and a lot of those have been at, at, at the behest and pushing and shoving of doctoral students, which is why, you know, in terms of, of, of diversity, um, you know, being a faculty member, one of the best forms of diversity is that I get to meet and, and engage with some amazing young minds that actually changed how I think about things. I remember very clearly one of my doctoral students when I was at, at Kellogg, uh, Jeff Polzer, who's currently a faculty member at the Harvard Business School. Uh, he was one of my students and he said, you know, I, I don't want to study negotiation because people will just think I'm your clone and I don't want to be your clone. And he said, so what I'm really interested in is teams. And I go, Jeff, I don't know anything about teams. He said, well, you're smart. You can learn. Let's do that. And I said, okay, well, well, yeah, sure. And that created that whole path where, you know, it now became one of the areas where I'm known for. But that was at the behest of a doctoral student who didn't want to be a clone in negotiation. So he's a teams person. And he led me, you know, he led me to that, sort of to change that perspective. I had another doctoral student. For, and she was a, a person, of, a woman of color. And for her, for her, it was really important to understand her place in the world. And that required me to become more knowledgeable about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and again, it was always something that was in the background. I was certainly, I mean, it certainly was important to me because I was always like the sole female in a group of males kind of thing. So I had a lot of experience being being perceived as a token rather than a solo, right? You know, oh, you're here because affirmative action got you here. Um, and so, you know, that was also important to me, but I never really embraced that. And through, through working with her, I embraced that in a way that had an impact on both her career and my career. Um, so what I say is that, you know, if you come to a fork in the road, pick that fork up and take it, you know, <laughs> just move on, try, try something new, try something different, see if it works. Um, and some of the things that I er early on worked on, I don't work on anymore. I did a lot of stuff with human resource management decision, HRM decision making. It, it, it didn't really, you know, sort of make me as excited about it as, as some of the other stuff that I've done over the years. And so that kind of fell by the wayside. And, you know, I've, I've made a career out of paying attention to my doctoral students. And Peter Bellamy was one of them who we do, we do a lot of stuff on status, which yeah. I had never done until I worked with Peter. Yeah. So, yeah. One thing I learned today, distinguished professor emerita is a another level up, not just professor emeritus. And so you are distinguished professor emerita at Stanford, um, very small group. You can count them on one hand uh, that have that distinction. What, what's the next frontier for you? What are you most excited about now? Oh, well, you know, it's interesting because I have retired. And so people say, well, you know, are you still doing research? And, I, and the answer is yes, I am. But it's primarily to finish up projects. And re sometimes research projects take years. And so uh, I'm still working on a couple of research projects. Uh, I don't have new doctoral students because, you know, when Stanford says, are you going to retire? They mean like, you know, you can't keep having doc. You can be on a committee, but you can't manage a doctoral student, which is fine. So now I'm actually doing other stuff. And so, my, but my other stuff is kind of weird because it turns out in COVID, 
you know, COVID actually got me to do something I had never done before, which is I'd always in college and graduate school and, and even in high school, I never had taken much humanities courses because I was taking science courses and labs and things like that. And so I took a painting course and my painting instructor told me, Maggie, if you want to paint, you need to learn how to draw because you don't know how to draw. <laughs> and so I started taking drawing classes and I found that I fell in love with charcoal portraiture. And so both figure drawings and, you know, faces. And so I am spin and 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 that led me to deciding, which is much harder. I'm pretty good at charcoal portraiture. I'm terrible at oil painting. So now I'm trying to become an oil painter, which is more of a challenge for me. I am going to take possession of a brand new custom built road bike because I am live in central Texas and the the roads are some of the best <laughs> road biking in, in the country, certainly in Texas. And I'm learning to do that. Uh, I continue to ride my horses. I have dogs and chickens and cows and you know my life is completely filled and I still teach and do executive ed do. at Stanford and you know now we have the opportunity for virtual I teach a number of virtual courses so from my home office in Texas and so my life is completely filled I just don't have to go to committee meetings anymore and I don't have to grade <laughs> you know so all good <laughs> Absolutely amazing, and you do not stop, and the world thanks you for that. Professor Margaret Neal, a distinguished professor emerita at Stanford Graduate School of Business, thank you so much for joining us. I will have in the show notes, Maggie, your links, how people reach you, but is there a best place that you would have send them first? Yes. So basically go to the website, getting more of what you want dot com. That's mm -hmm. for the book. It's got a lot of stuff. It's not well curated because that's not what I do. That's not how I spend my time. So you can you're welcome to use whatever's there, but do not send me a note and tell me that my website is ugly because I already <laughs> know it is. So like it's fine. But you'll see both me and my co author. Both of us are represented there with podcasts blog posts, articles we've written, you know, just go there and use it as you will. And the other thing is that if you want to contact me directly, just go to Stanford Graduate School of Business and there's a link when you go to my website, you can link and send me a note. Yeah. And I'm still there. I'm still getting notes from that. So you are still there. Maggie, thank you so much. Very much appreciate all your time today. Thank you. Michael, thank you. It's been a delight. Great speaking with you. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com That's www.changwenderoth.com